Welcome back to the IE427 Garage, everybody. Today, we are continuing work on our prototype Mark IV. And the big quest in this video is to get that Gen 2 Coyote back in the car. All right, so everything we're doing today and probably for the next couple of days is a quest to get everything we need in order so that we can get that Gen 2 Coyote back in the car. Now, if you remember, we had to pull that engine out of the chassis because we needed to finish up the foot boxes. The owner slid the motor and the transmission into the chassis so he could transport the car out here from Texas. And although it made it easier for him, and for us, for that matter, to get the car out here, it made it nearly impossible to get the foot boxes in place. So we pulled that, uh, that engine and transmission out, uh, I think the last time we were working on the car, and this time we're going to do everything we can to get that back in the car and start moving forward on whatever's left for the plumbing, start on the electrical, the chassis harness, and the coyote wiring, and then um, keep moving this project forward. We did start the morning here, with a little surprise at the shop. A little snow flurry in Southern California today. Now we are up at about, oh, about a thousand feet. And I was just watching the news and they were talking about how the snow level had dropped. So this is just one of those things you don't see very often in Southern California. It's still too warm to accumulate, but pretty cool. All right, so I think the last time that I can remember it's snowing here was probably about 20 years ago. And um, I was out in the back of the shop yesterday um, doing some stuff. And, I, and, it, and it was what I thought was just a light sprinkle. It turned out we had snow two days ago, too. But it was real light. Um, uh, very small flakes and, and uh, again, no, no accumulation. But today, we got, uh, we got a good amount of snow. Now, again, it was, there was no accumulation because there was just... The, it, it's not cold enough here. But uh, we did have quite a bit of snow. And it snowed for a good hour and a half. And... The funny thing was the the snowflakes were big. I mean, they were like the size of your fist as they were coming down from the sky, and uh, so it was a little odd because you're not used to it here. We um we get snow in the local mountains all the time every year, you know, and there's they're skiing up in the, the the local resorts, but we generally don't get them down here where the shop is because we're just not high enough in elevation. But it got cold enough today that it it snowed pretty good. Um, so let me walk you around the car. And uh, I'll show you what I've done so far. Um, some of this has nothing to do with getting the engine in, but obviously some of it does. And so uh, let me get under the car since I've got it up in the air, and I'll show you exactly what one of the last things that we needed to get in place is. And now that we've got those in, we'll be able to get the engine and the transmission put back in place. All right. As I stated in one of the previous videos, I have just had enough with... Let me see if I can grab a light. This um, Factory 5 brake handle. It is by far the worst design I have ever seen. Now, it looks prettier. I'll give them that. It looks prettier than the, uh, the donor route, but the donor route works so much better. So what we did is we put a, uh, this is a 2000, no, 2003? 2003 brake handle, and we got it on eBay. So there are a couple of online uh, suppliers that sell on eBay. Um, one, of, one of the companies that uh, sell a lot of Mustang parts is a company that used to sell what are, were called donor pallets for the Factory 5 Roadsters. And so 
we actually bought this from them, but through eBay. And so that's the, the brake handle right now. And it's in great condition. There's no rust on it. And uh, it, lo it, it, it looks nearly brand new. And so we used that. And what I did is I adjusted it before I put it in. And uh, if you're looking to see how to adjust one of these donor handles, go online, go, uh, go, go, go to YouTube, and just type in, uh, uh, you know, uh, Fox Mustang or SN95 Mustang brake handle. Um, and there, there's probably two dozen different uh, videos that show how to modify these to make them work a little bit better. Um, the later ones like this one from the 2004 already have the modifications done to it. So really, all you need to change if you want to um, make them a little bit better is change the position of what is called the PAWL. So P-A-W-L. Um, and that's just the part that uh, the ratcheting mechanism latches into. And you can adjust that and then bring your cables a little bit tighter. So I did that. I've got them about as tight as we want to get them. But you can see there's an equalizer built into this at the end of the cable from the, the, the handle. And so what we ended up doing is we went with a stock Mustang SN95 brake cable. So these cables would fit a 94 through a 98 Mustang GT or um, I think even the, the V6 model. I think they're all the same brake cables. So you can see they have a much shorter distance from the end of the housing of the cable to um, allow the cable stick out at the end versus the ones from Factory 5 or the ones that they supply, which are more of a Fox body style Mustang brake uh, cable. So these will go in the forward mount and we've got them routed back in the tunnel here. And I've still got to strap them in place. But um, we went ahead and we terminated them at the two brake calipers as well. So you can see up here, I've got the cable terminated and it is into the um, the brake pole as part of the parking brake that are on these Wellwood um, calipers. And it just slid right in. I mean, it went right, the, the cable went right into where it needed to and then the grommet on the end went into where it needed to go to. And the emergency brake on this car works perfectly. There is plenty of handle throw, so you can get um, good uh, a good mechanical advantage to get the brake, parking brake set. And there's plenty of leverage. So as, you, as you're pulling it, because that cable goes around that wheel, it actually enables you, you to get much more leverage than you can get out of the, uh, the Factory 5 one, which is almost a one-to-one -one pull when you pull on that thing. So it works great. Um, I'll lower the car down and then um, I'll show you exactly where the parking brake starts engaging and, and how much more pull we actually have on it. So as the pads were, we'll actually be able to get a little bit more pull on it if we need to. All right, so here's the donor handle. And like I said, the, the, the factory front five one looks nicer because you know, it's, it's got a nice aluminum handle and you know, a little aluminum button on the end. And by the time you get the boot on there, I mean, it looks nice. But this one works just so, so well. So here, here it is. So right there is where the wheels are locked. And I got the wheels up in the air. And, you know, I can't, I'm pushing pretty hard against this thing. And I can't get it to move. And there's probably, I don't know, half a dozen more clicks. Because it's clicked in right here at the bottom. And you can see there's clicks all the way up to here before it bottoms out. And it's already tight. So we've got plenty of adjustment in the, the handle left that uh, as the brake pads wear, the, brake, the, the, the emergency brake's still going to work. And, uh, you know, with this one, you don't really have to pull it back a whole lot. All you got to do is push the button and it goes forward and now the, the brakes are off. Okay, so now you can see this one rolls. There's a little bit of drag on it, but that's because the brake pads are new. But... Um, so, so, so the brake handle going the donor route works so much better. And if you're using the, the, the factory supplied, the, the factory five supplied rear brake calipers, which are Mustang calipers anyway, it's plug and play. Where when you start mixing all these different parts that they're using, they're using SN95 rear calipers with Fox body cables, and then they're using their handle. I mean, and then it's got to run under the frame. 
I, I just this this is a much better way 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 to go about it. So this is the way we did it on this car. I'm really satisfied with the way it worked out. Now, um, this is what else I've been working on, and this has nothing to do with getting the engine back in place. But um, as uh, I finished up the last video, you guys saw me put the uh, drop trunk uh, box together and put it in the car. But you didn't see the uh, the hole cut in the in the the bottom of the trunk to access that uh, that drop trunk mod. So I've gone to going to put this in. I've drilled all the holes in the top. Now I just have to drill the holes in the back. So I want to get this finished, even though it's not going to go in right now, um, because I've still got to put the gas tank back in place, and I've got to get the um, uh, fuel lines in back here before I get this all buttoned up. It's just a lot easier to access all that stuff with that panel out. But I wanted to get it all pre-drilled. So I'm gonna work on that the rest of this afternoon, and then I'm hoping tomorrow that, uh, hopefully it's not gonna be raining, um, I can bring the, um, the shop crane in and then drop the engine back in place because I've got everything that I need in place now. All the foot box aluminum is in, all the trans, tunnel aluminum is in and so we're pretty much ready to set that engine back in place and then I can put the steering shaft back in I can start running the electrical to the front I can put my fuel pressure regulator in which is going to go on the firewall right there I can measure for my fuel lines in the front and get those ordered along with the ones in the back that I need I can get all the coyote control pack stuff mounted on the front there so you can see just by getting the engine in the uh, the floodgates just like open up completely. I'll be able to uh, to get a lot of stuff done, and and all of those things, even though they're somewhat significant, don't take a whole lot of time. So like running the wiring harness to the front, I mean it's a couple of uh, uh, cushion clips, and uh, you know a little bit of time, and it's in. Um, and then you know the fuel lines, I just, I've got to measure those, and then I've got to give those measurements to the hose shop, and they'll make the the lines, and then the the fuel lines will basically just screw in. So you can get a lot of stuff done like that once that engine goes in. So I'm going to work really hard this afternoon to get that back panel of the trunk all ready to go and then put it aside. And then tomorrow I'm going to work on getting the engine put back in place. So I guess I'll catch up with you guys tomorrow unless, unless I have anything more significant to tell, uh, to tell you or show you today. So we'll see you tomorrow. It is the next night and let's see what's on the, Van Halen, dancing in the street. Um, here's what I'm working on tonight. I got um, I got the back of the cockpit cut out for our package tray. Now we were gonna do the standard Breeze Cubby, which is just uh, I think it's two four and a half inch holes joined together. So you end up with this oval-shaped um, cubby hole. But when I let the, uh, the car owner know that that was going to limit his access to the seatbelt mounts, from either side, once the partition went in, and the partition, once it's in, it's in. Um, I mean, I could make one that, uh, that might be able to come out of there, but uh, the one that uh, he got from Breeze Automotive... It rivets in, and once it's in, it's in. So there would have been no way to get to the seatbelts if they ever needed to be changed. So what I did is uh, we started a conversation and started texting back and forth, and I sent him some pictures of Joel's car, which is a Mark III that we did a number of years ago. And uh, we did the same thing in Joel's car. We had a nice package tray that separated kind of the cockpit from the trunk with... Um, a barrier or a wall right about here. So we're going to use that breeze kit, but we opened up this entire area so that um, they'll have full access to it. It'll be all carpeted. Um, if you remember, we did this on the silver car, um, the one we called the tuxedo, and we also did this one on Michael's car. Now both the tuxedo and Michael's car had sound system uh, provisions in them as well. So that ate up a lot of trunk. I mean, by the time we were done with those two, you know, we lost trunk space all the way to about here.
and uh, on this one we're not going to lose as much trunk space but we are going to lose about eight inches of trunk space so what I did tonight is when I cut this out I actually cut it in place I drilled holes pilot holes in the corners and then I enlarged those holes in the corners with a step bit and that enabled me to get my electric shear in here and cut along the frame here and up and across and then on this side as well so today what I did is I filled that gap right here with some of the polyurethane sealant that we've been using on the panels and then I took um, a ball peen hammer and I just went along this edge and rounded the the uh, the aluminum over so it makes a nice point uh, a nice tight joint in here and um, that sealant takes up any of the gap so once we put our heat and sound mat on that and we get some carpet on it it's going to be just perfect still have to clean up some of the edges here i got to file the corners but other than that it's pretty well set the other thing that i've done this evening is welded in studs for and they're still hot so i don't want to touch them all of our grounds so here in the cockpit i welded in a stud on the passenger side this will be just behind the glove box and anything that we need to land grounds on over here we've got a ground stud for that and then I welded one in over here on the driver's side, which is where we're going to land the chassis ground. We're actually going to have to lengthen that chassis ground to, lead, uh, to reach that. And then all of our grounds for everything behind the dash are going to either go to this ground here or the one we've got over here. Now, I will tomorrow, um, when these are nice and cooled off, I'll clean up around the weld. I'll tape and mask it off. And I'll shoot that with uh, some of the, uh, what is it, the Pour 15 uh, chassis black. And that'll get it all sealed up so there won't be any rust. And then um, I think probably in the next day or two, we ought to be able to drop the engine in. Now I'm waiting on a part for my, not my shop crane, but the, the, the leveler, the equalizer. I had, uh, it's got this handle on it. And the last couple times I've used it, I've just had trouble with the handle wanting to come off. And it just started doing this. I've had that leveler for years, and this has never happened. So I think what, what has happened is that the threads, because it's just a bolt, it's a 3 8 bolt threaded into the handle, and then there's this lock nut. And the lock nut goes against the plastic so that basically it spins on the mechanism on the, the threaded portion of the bolt and up until lately it's worked just fine but um, for whatever reasons the thread inside the plastic has started to give away and the last two times I've used the, uh, the equalizer it just it just doesn't work and so I ordered a new handle um, for like a lathe or a mill from uh, I think it was McMaster car and uh, I'm gonna use that because it's a uh, they call it a rotating handle so it's 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 made for this and uh, it should be able I should be able to redrill and tap into the actual um, uh, mechanism the handle mechanism and then get the new handle in so I'm kind of waiting on that it should be here tomorrow or the next day and then once I get that all squared away I'll, I'll probably drop the uh, the engine back in but it's been raining the last couple of days too and so I don't want to go out to the shed and get the uh, the engine hoist and all that out in the rain so Anyways, I think that's where I'm going to leave it for tonight. I'll catch up with you guys tomorrow. All right, everybody, next night, let me work on getting the, uh, the engine crane and the engine level are all set up, get the car in place, and then I will bring you back as we put the engine into the prototype.
so that's it. I got the engine back in and um, now we've got, uh, oh, we've got a lot of stuff we can do on the car. I think what I'm probably going to start with next is some of the cooling stuff. And I've got to finish up the fuel system. So I'm probably going to get the fuel pressure regulator in place. And that will allow me to get my hoses ordered from the hose shop, which will also allow me to get some of the power steering hose stuff started because I like to use the factory ends for the rack for the power steering rack and so uh, I'll be able to start on that so um, as you can see the the engines in the car uh, this isn't you know a hey look at me but um, from start to finish I had the engine in the car in about 20 minutes and um, it's it's after dinner now and I think It took me maybe 20 minutes to get the uh, the transmission A-frame in there. And I've just got the transmission setting on the A-frame right now. Honestly, we have to wait until we get our drive shaft in place. Or we've got to get it kind of mocked up in place to see whether or not we're going to need a spacer. Because a lot of times the yoke that comes out of the back of transmission will... Um, make contact with the four inch round tube that goes from uh, side to side and so we'll have to space the transmission up a little bit in the back um with the the um solid axle um sometimes you can squeak by um but on almost every independent rear suspension car i've done i've had to put a spacer of about three quarters of an inch in there so we'll see if we uh we end up having to do that i will say that the new handle on the engine leveler worked out just perfectly. I was able to use the engine leveler um, like it was designed to, to be used and uh, the way I've used it for God knows how long. Like I said, it's, it's just been in the last, the last few uh, times that I've used the, uh, the shop crane and the engine leveler that I've had a, a, an issue with the, the handle. So I'm glad that that worked out. You can see I've got the uh, Factory 5 engine stand just sitting here. I'm probably going to dismantle that. Um, and it's amazing. I let this thing sit outside for like four days and it flash rusted. So, you know, I, I don't know. I don't know. There must have been no, uh, no coating on, on the steel at all. I know a lot of times when I buy steel from uh, the material uh, wholesaler that uh, they've got like a, a almost like a thin machine oil that's uh, on most of the, the, the steel that you buy that you have to clean off before you do any fabrication or welding. Um, and that's just to protect the steel from, from flash rusting, you know, when you buy it. So I don't know. Anyways, I'm going to end the video here. If you guys are enjoying the content here, please do the like, the share, the subscribe, all that kind of stuff. We'll see you next time. Have a great day.